So um, tonight, as you know, we're going to be here talking about the technology revolution in education. And uh, our chair or moderator uh, today is Dr. Manolis Mavrikis here. Um, and he's Associate Professor in Learning Technologies at UCL's Knowledge Lab, which is obviously at UCL. And he's also Director of the Education and Technology MA program. Uh, and he's Innovation and Enterprise Lead at the Department of Culture, Communication and Media. Um, so this whole area is like bang in the middle of your research interests, I think. Um, and then our two speakers, so um, Manolis is going to give a, a brief sort of overview of the field to start us off, I think. And then uh, our two speakers are Jakob Raven and Takehiko Kariya, so in that order. Um, so Jakob Raven is Executive Director of Teaching and Learning at Copenhagen Business School. And what he's working on at the moment is the Business School's strategic initiative to implement blended learning uh, as the main delivery mode for its programs. Uh, and he is also head of the teaching and learning department at Copenhagen Business School. And then uh, Kadia Sensei, very nice to have him here. Um, we were up in Oxford with him a couple of weeks ago. But um, so he's professor of sociology uh, of Japanese society uh, at the Nissan Institute of Japanese studies at the University of Oxford um, and he works also on education related issues particularly on issues of inequality uh, in education um, a subject on which he's published pretty extensively in both Japanese and English so on that note I'm going to hand over to Dr. Manolis Mavrikis to run the show from now on thank you Thank you for, for the invitation and thanks in advance to the speakers for what they're going to introduce. Um, I just wanted to, be, to give a little bit like an overview of, of some research in, in the field. I'm going to position it especially around artificial intelligence because I know it's something that concerns a lot of us and it's kind of close to my heart because of my, my research. Um, before that, a little advertisement, <laughs> uh, but you'll see the link later on. I'm, I'm also um, editor-in-chief on the British Journal of Educational Technology, and uh, in fact, um, these days mark the end of the 50th year of, of the journal, and I have a, a copy with me if you want to have a look later on. But the reason I'm mentioning this is that especially in this issue, uh, which is open access and available for about a year, so you'd have the opportunity, even if you are not subscribers, to have a look. We reflect on 50 years of educational technology, and there are two specific sub-issues in, in this issue, um, particularly on the role of artificial intelligence in education. And um, I'm we don't have a lot of time, and actually this is running out of battery, so I may want to plug it. So I don't have to hurry up so much, since we plugged it now, but um, uh, I'm sure a lot of things come to your mind around artificial intelligence. One that may be <coughs> close and you can kind of relate to is recent announcements around the um, artificial intelligence uh, kind of taking over um, in the game of Go. I wonder how many of you are familiar with this picture and context? Okay, not many. Um, the idea basically being that uh, particularly efforts from the Google team uh, called Alpha have uh, surpassed a human player in the game of Go. And this tends to generate anxiety from many perspectives and also a lot of criticism in the field. And when we're looking at how artificial intelligence is applied in education, um, this 
opens up some some challenges or also some benefits but also potential limitations and, and concerns. I'm going to share with you some um, a quote. I don't want to scare you necessarily. Um, I know it's long and some of you back there may not be able to read it, so I, I will read it. Um, it's not from me. I will tell you in the end from when this quote is. It's not my aim to surprise or shock you, but the simplest way I can summarize it is to say that there are now in the world machines that can think, that learn, and that create. Moreover, their ability to do these things is going to increase rapidly until in the visible future, the range of problems they can handle will co be coexistive with the range to which human minds has been applied. So this could be something that people would say today. When do you think this was said? Guess? Anyway. Um, it's from Herbert Simon, 1957. So, um, obviously, it might have been an exaggeration back then, but and it might be seen today as an exaggeration, but a lot of people are concerned around, around this these days. And when we apply this whole thinking of artificial intelligence in education, there is also a valid concern, and I think our speakers later on will um, highlight some, some of the of the points there. One can be summarized uh, nicely, perhaps with this picture, um, which I use usually kind of to provoke and has been used a lot in the field to to provoke thinking around around this area of the application of educational technology and with the criticism being that students are being turned into the machines that they are being um, fed uh, books and kind of passive learning approaches and so on. Um, I want to be a little bit provocative just for the purposes of, of this talk now and to have a kind of a positive uh, view just for the discussion and to open up um, different aspects and share a little bit some of the work that we are doing at the UCL Knowledge Lab and some of the findings that are coming out from the journal of uh, the British Journal of Education Technology that I mentioned before and share kind of the high level finding that um, for this audience now in that we know that there are obviously all these criticism of um, education and technology, and we can discuss them more later on in the day. But the main thing that um, we are finding, and to some of you might be sounding obvious, is that the, the pedagogy, the way that this technology is applied, matters a lot. And to that, we need to bring in the, the teachers in the context that, um, that they're using the education and technology, but also a lot the parents, if not obviously the students, themselves, hence I'm saying this, these pictures of teachers being trained with, about technology, which is something that we do a lot at the masters, for example, uh, that we have here at the lab, um, but also the, the uh, appreciating the needs of, of the students that are usually in the center of all of this, but especially when we're talking about younger learners, to how we bring their parents into into the picture. And technology has some affordances to allow for that. Um, I'm going to share just very briefly one example of a recent project, and if you are interested in that, I'll be around later on. We can talk more about it. Um, it's uh, called IREAD. It's a, a European funded project that we are working on at, at UCL with another 15 partners across Europe. We are building games for helping students to become more proficient readers. Um, and of course, there are a lot of these apps around. I'm not uh, advocating any uh, innovation there. What we are trying to do is, with using some artificial intelligence techniques, we sequence the content appropriately according to the learner profile. And again, I see some heads nodding. You may have seen this kind of tools around, and a lot of people are claiming that they're using artificial intelligence to be able to um, adapt and personalize the content to the students. Um, what we are finding and what we are trying to do, and again for more results I can discuss later on, is to bring in both the teachers and the parents I mentioned it earlier, 
So on one hand, we're using the data that are generated from this system to provide help to the teachers on how they integrate the technology in the classroom, how they do plenaries with, uh, with, the find, with using the profiles of the students that the system generates, um, and giving them some tools like this one that helps them orchestrate what we call orchestrate the classroom, basically uh, be able to know which student to go and to talk first with this, for example, this red um, icon demonstrates a student that a teacher may want to, to, to prioritize. So, with this, I hope this brief introduction kind of gives you an example of a, a kind of, a, let's say, a good use of AI in education. And just briefly sharing my vision also with the colleagues here, when we're talking about applications of artificial intelligence in education, uh, we're referring mostly to augmentation, assistance, mentoring, or expanding human intelligence. And um, with this, I thought of providing a couple of examples, a couple of pointers for you, uh, if you are interested more in, in this area. One is a report that uh, comes out from a project with the Open University colleagues and UCL Knowledge Lab colleagues called Technology Enhanced Personalized Learning. I have a few, a few of these reports with me, if you are interested in that. We are raising questions that people can ask when others are claiming that they are using artificial intelligence and they are uh, personalizing content. And uh, two other pointers, just very briefly. A recent book covering the area of artificial intelligence in education by Wayne Holmes, and, uh, a colleague at the Open University, and uh, Rose Lakin, Machine Learning and Human Intelligence, who is a colleague at the UCL Knowledge Lab and might be around later on today. So with that, I will uh, invite uh, the next speakers to, to share their thoughts. My name is Jakob, uh, and uh, as mentioned, I, I teach at Copenhagen Business School, uh, but I'm also heading an initiative on blended learning. And my main kind of, of approach today for, for, for this talk is that technology, uh, the kind of impact on education is much more than just impacting what goes on in, in the classroom. It's uh, an impact that goes far beyond that, actually. It's, it's changing the entire landscape of, of education, I think. So, so what I'm going to talk about is how does technology uh, in, in education change the entire ecosystem of, of uh, education. So my own background is that I've, I've already been, all, all of my time actually been engaged in education. I have either been a student or a teacher in, in basically all my life. Uh, I went to elementary school in the 70s, there were, and in the beginning of the 80s. There were no computers, no technology in classrooms. Then I went to high school in, in the late 80s. There were some personal computers uh, there, but it was not used very intensively. Uh, it started in the beginning of the 90s to be more widespread, used uh, as, as, as a tool for doing assignments. When I went to, to university, a lot of the students used it. But basically as uh, advanced typewriters. It was uh, typewriters with a memory. What made a significant change was the World Wide Web in the mid-90s. That, in a very few years, actually transformed the way we accessed information. It transformed the way we communicate. <coughs> so the last couple of decades since that, that transformation have made computers much faster, the internet connections much faster, and nearly, practically, we have unlim unlimited storage of data today. So we have 
a lot of things have happened in, in just a couple of decades from the mid-90s until today. And the development has been really uh, rapid. It, a lot of things have happened in a very short period of time and also within education. So it changes the society in, 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 at large, but also, of course, the educational area. And uh, I think that technology changes education in, in at least two ways. One is it changes the way uh, at what we are supposed to learn students in the educational system, and it changes the how how the students are supposed to learn what we want them to learn. So, society changes, and it, it's, as mentioned, it, it goes on really fast these years. And uh, what happens is that the labor market changes accordingly, and the, the labor market actually is a very important driver for the educational system. The, the educational system has historically and also today been a, a main provider of, of uh, educated labor for the labor force. And the, the labor market needs are always and have always, always been a really important kind of, of denominator for, for what is teached in, in the educational system. It's not the only thing that denominates what, what we are teaching in the educational system, but it's a very important kind of driver. <coughs> uh, so new educational demands on what are we going to teach. Uh, the how is about the increased accessibility to information and knowledge. And, uh, We organize the learning experience quite different uh, than before we had any uh, technological kind of tools in education. But also the students themselves organize their learning experience very differently. So it's not like it's only the educational institutions and the labor market who drives the changes. It's also to a large extent the students themselves. They demand different kinds of, of, uh, of, of learning experiences, and they look themselves for information and knowledge and find it in a lot of different places. So it's not like the only opportunity to take an education is in the formal educational system anymore. To a large extent, the, the possibilities of, of gaining knowledge and information is broadened to a lot of different arenas and uh, learning takes basically place everywhere. So I will, in the rest of my presentation, try to elaborate a bit more on these two, the what and the how. And I'll begin with the, the what and not least the labor market changes that goes on in these years. So. If we look at the labor market uh, and then the tendencies on the labor markets, there's two major trends at the moment. There's demographic changes, and I'm, sh I'm sure that uh, my colleague will uh, uh, tell more about that from, 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 uh, from this perspective. Uh, my perspective is basically that, that uh, people remain longer on the labor market. So from an educational point of view, we you know that, that people will need to be educated not only one time during a, a career, but a lot of times. So whereas we, we had a kind of pattern in the modern society where you took education for approximately 25 years, then you worked for about 30 years, and you had retirement for, for 15 years. It is changing to something like more in, in, in like 20 years of education, 45 years of, of, of uh, work life, and 15 years of retirement or something like that. So what is the point here is that the 
ideas on the labor market is extended. If, if we look at the example from Denmark, retirement age right now is 72 years. It's predicted to be 77 years and 20 years from now. So, looking at a career where you get ed educated in the first 20 years, maybe 25 years, and then you will need to <coughs> stay on the labor market for something like 50, 55 years longer than that. That demands another kind of skill pool or some other capabilities than before where you would expect that you could stay on the labor markets for 30, maybe 35 years if you were lucky. So skills need to be updated several times during a career. Then the digitalization. We all know that a lot of, of uh, the jobs today, they, the, or industries at least, uh, are automized and uh, that robotics have, uh, have possibilities of, of uh, taking over uh, a lot of new areas as well. If we look at, for example, some industries like the publishing industry, like the media, so on. There have been tremendous, tremendous changes in what skills are needed just during the last 10, 20 years. So, the, for example, in the, in the uh, publishing uh, industry, it is expected from, from the industry itself that a, a approximately 80% of the workforce within the European Union that is 750,000 uh, employers, uh, employees, they're going to need reskilling within the next five years. So it's a huge, and that's just one industry. So there's a huge need for reskilling, and that happens more and more often because, because the skills just get outdated faster. Not all skills, but a lot of skills actually get outdated a lot faster than we were used to before. <coughs> so the outdating of, 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 of skills is one thing. The other thing is that there is a, a lot of discussion about is there something you could call robot-proof kind of, of capabilities? Is there something that the educa educational system should train the students for that would uh, be like like a kind of, of proof even though even though that industries get automated and, and, and uh, artificial intelligence uh, are taking over some areas that were previously done by humans and the discussion in, in that area I'll just uh, have a look at it in a moment I will just look at the robot-proof uh, kind of skills that are mentioned in that discussion and then also have a look about how skills get <coughs> outdated faster. If we have a look at, this is just one example of, out of really many examples of, of predictions for what we can call 21st century skills or, or, or robot-proof kind of, of uh, capabilities. This is from the World Economic Forum. And it, it, maybe some of you in the back can't see it, but, but it basically divides capabilities into two, three different areas, literacies, <coughs> competences, and character qualities. So what is, is mentioned here is, is the skills like collaboration, communication, creativity. It's like cultural and civic uh, literacy. It's like curiosity, initiative things like that, adaptability as well. So that's the kind of skills that are mentioned in, 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 in those kind of predictions of, of 21st century skills. And they are, they are typically being produced by asking a lot of industry leaders and, and employers, what do you think you will need in the future? From an educational point of view, what you, you lack in a picture like this 
and that, that is uh, really interesting here, is that there is no kind of deep expert knowledge <coughs> in those kind of 21st century skill set uh, predictors. So, so it looks like that the, the labor market uh, doesn't really think about the expert kind of, of knowledge areas that they also, of course, need. But there's so much focus on these kind of more soft skills than there are on, on the traditional disciplines. Uh, than the, and, and the educational system is so built up around disciplinary expert knowledge. That's, that's how we think. So, so this is actually a really different way of talking about <coughs> what our graduates should be able to do in the future. If we take an example of, of, uh, of how skills get outdated faster, we can just take one example like this one, it's from the Udemy research. Uh, but again, it's one example out of really many that kind of, of uh, illustrates that our, the, the typical kind of uh, skills that are in demand on the labor market gets outdated very fast. And this illustrates that the, the, the that the skill, the skills gap in the U.S. Uh, is experienced as highly increasing from 2014 to 2018, from about 60 percent to approximately 87 percent in in 2018, and that's the skill gap in the labor market in the U.S. So, a skill gap of 87% of the labor force experience some kind of skill gap. And that's, that's a really huge number of, of, uh, of people who at their daily work experience some kind of skill gap. So again, this need for retraining is much more continuous than we were used to just 10, 15, 20 years ago and even more beyond that. <coughs> so, my point is that the labor market changes rapidly, the need for, for, for skills changes, and the need for, for, for continual, continuous update of skills also changes very fast. So let's have a look on the other part of the uh, technology changes in education, the how the students learn. And that's about the educational system itself. So how does technology go into the educational system? It's how about how the students learn and how new technology changes student learning. And it changes student learning in many different ways. One way is the access and interaction with the curriculum, uh, information and knowledge. Access to information changes really dramatically. Acquisition of knowledge and delivery modes of information changes. Pace and place changes very rapidly these years. It, it becomes more and more uh, widespread and, and common to take your education as partly online and uh, also to, to take it in much more flexible modes. Uh, it also becomes much more individualized, partly because of, of uh, a lot of, of programs and research like the one we just uh, show, saw an example of, uh, adaptive learning. Uh, and this kind of adaptive learning trends also tend to make learning much more individualized than we were used to. But also the social interaction changes. As, as mentioned, the communication, the collaboration changes because then new ways of interaction between students and between uh, teachers and students. 
And of course, the learning support changes a lot. We have e-advice and a lot of different kind of learning support that is not going on as uh, with, uh, that couldn't uh, be in place without technology. So it supports learning in a, in a lot of different ways and, and changes the way we were used to, to, to facilitate learning in many different ways. These changes may seem like simple changes that make learning processes more efficient. And they, they do in, in some sense, but it's, it doesn't only make the learning more efficient. It's, as mentioned in the beginning, also changes the very educational system. So the current educational system uh, and the current educational systems are designed for knowledge transmission, basically. It's designed for a transmission of knowledge from one generation to the other. So that's how we think of education, and that's how we build up educational systems. So learning are organized in cohorts. There are little individual flexibility, traditionally. Pace, place, and content, and learning styles are typically fixed, at least to some extent. So if you take this kind of change in the system, you have the traditional system, the, a very knowledge-centered kind of educational system. You have stacked programs with a lot of courses coming on top of each other. And, and all the students have to take the same courses in nearly the same sequence. You have fixed learning schedules, fixed pace. You have one learning path for all students, even though we know that good teachers can individualize to some extent, it's more or less one learning path for all of them. And it's very formally organized in the educational institutions. What is happening is that now a, a, a change towards learning taking place outside the formal educational systems to a much larger extent than we are used to. So, what happens now is that a lot of skills are uh, at, uh, possible to, to uh, uh, learn outside the formal educational system. You can, you can take a MOOC, a massive online open course on, on any of the MOOC platforms. It's for free unless you want a certificate. And you can take it at the pace and place you like. So what happens is that when you need some kind of a skill in the working place, you very often see that people can find some kind of training of that skill that just fits their needs and are convenient and much easier to access than formal education. So what has happened is that there are a lot of micro-learning opportunities uh, available. And it's, as mentioned, just in time learning. It, it's very individualized. It's very adaptive to the individual learner. It's informal, less organized. So this is new learning opportunities that have arisen. But it's not like it's just is completely two parallel systems. It seems to me like that the new learning opportunities that have uh, come up in, in, in the last at least five to 10 years also influence the traditional system. So if you take the uh, new providers, they respond to changes in demand. That's why there's a lot of new providers in the educational system. New educational providers, typically private providers, they they, 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 they are there because the established educational system responds quite slowly. The established educational system is established for a very long-term kind of uh, and stable kind of society. So the established educational system is not uh, able to, to 
react very quick to changes in, for example, skill demands from the labor market. So that's why the come new providers to, to education. And what happens is that the traditional kind of system that we know that you went to, to preschool, to kindergarten, to primary school, to secondary school, to college, to university, or whatever you did, that is changing at, at, as we're speaking, actually, it is uh, changing. Those are providers that, that actually provides many different parts of that uh, delivery, as we before so, saw, as if you were an educational institution, no matter if you were a secondary school, college, university, or whatever, you provided the entire kind of delivery. You provided the lectures, you provided the exams, you provided the kind of teaching, the, the learning support, you provided the social life of the students. You provided the degrees afterwards. What happens is that these kind of elements of the education is unbundled. So a lot of different providers actually go and provide the individual parts of an education. This doesn't mean that we will not have universities in, in five years, or we will not have secondary school. Of course we will. For sure, and there will still be a market for, for, for that kind of bundled education. No, no, uh, no doubt about that. But there will also be a huge market for this one. And this is actually the new thing. This is the new thing. And it will also influence the traditional system. So it's not like the, this system will just be as it were in, 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 in the future. It is changing. Um, it will also be more unbundled because some of the, the, the things that you can actually get from other providers is more attractive to many students. So many students are more attracted to this kind of flexible structuring, for example, and just in need, uh, uh, just in need skills uh, that you can have as, as uh, in the micro micro degrees and, and micro courses and micro credentials and, and these kind of things is difficult <coughs> to attain in the in the established formal education system. So my prediction is that that there will an unbundling of uh, education is happening at the moment and not just as a parallel kind of, of thing to the established system, it will influence the established system, it will become more unbundled, and of course technologies will also influence the traditional institutions as just providing more efficient uh, versions of the same thing as they did before, but it will also fundamentally change how we do things. That's it. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you very much for um, giving me this um, day great opportunity to um, talk here. Maybe this is my fourth or fifth time, maybe being here. Well, honestly speaking, I'm not an uh, expert on IT or new technologies and education, but I'm a sociologist. And uh, many of you may know that sociologist is very pessimistic. <laughs> <laughs> and then, always that our history tells us anything good proposed could have two edges, two edges. One is, of course, that some uh, idealistic goals, to some extent, are realized. But the, on the other side, always that the dark side of the story is also um, not often told. But uh, so that my part, probably my role being here is not adding to same ideas to the 
for two speakers, but maybe giving you some a bit critical or maybe uh, pessimistic views on the future. Okay. And then, since I'm a sociologist of Japanese society, then I'm going to use mostly Japanese case as a one of the most pessimistic <laughs> cases. <laughs> Well, to save my voice, I show you uh, one video clip. <laughs> well, of course, society, well, not 5.0, it's called society go ten zero in Japanese. I mean, of course, that, you know, first uh, society, I mean, that the first uh, uh, sort of uh, production revolution happens in agriculture. Second one, I think, uh, mass production. Third one is, I forget which one, but fifth one is something like that we are now seeking for the future. And the Japanese society or Japanese government should be, the, I think, uh, one of the global leaders in this kind of uh, policy or realizing such kind of uh, uh, society. Um, so, of course, uh, you know, they're, they're in their policy, uh, all technology could be regarded as the uh, solution. I mean, to solve very difficult problems Japanese society is now facing, like uh, aging society, and then also, uh, you know, uh, regional disparities, income disparities. I mean, all those kind of things, I think, are, you know, caused by present society situation should be, or will be, or can be, could be, would be, I don't know, uh, be solved by the new technology, which is realized uh, in society 5.0, or seeking for the realization of society 5.0, I mean, all new technology must be more, I think, radically uh, advanced. That is sort of things. But of course, that to realize uh, society 5.0, uh, we need a uh, uh, kind of human resources. That's why education is always, I mean, being accommodated to such kind of societal changes, and in particular, a pact in uh, uh, education policy or reform policies. And then, almost similar kind of words are, are being here, I think I just uh, Jacob talked about. Uh, so the ability to ac uh, ac accurately inter interpret and respond to writing information, ability to engage in and apply scientific thinking, and sensitivity and ability to discover and create value, curiosity, and I don't know what Or maybe I misspelled, but anyway. Maybe individuality, maybe. Okay. So it's 
from the government document. And then also the uh, government uh, Ministry of Education uh, document uh, says uh, human resources have to be, I think, a lead of this sort of a new society. And then not just, you know, uh, kind of talents or skills, I mean, to advance technology, but also how to survive in a sort of the uh, uh, society which is almost, you know, some percentage of current po occupations and jobs are gone. So that how you can have appropriate skills, I mean, to survive in such kind of society where AI probably will uh, control for our life. Okay, what we need. Lack of self-guided, independent learning in collaboration uh, with others while uh, steady mastering fundamental academic ability. So that's the problem. Then uh, does uh, new education have to provide a variety of learning opportunities and spaces to achieve fair and individually optimized learning, exactly individualization of learning. And in here, fairness, from my reading as a sociologist, it's very important value. I mean, how such kind of societal education change can maintain or improve fairness in a society if such kind of advancement in technology happens. Okay. So in the national curriculum, uh, in the Japanese context, they call it active learning. That is the more active uh, way of learning must be, I think, uh, realized rather than just passively learning uh, knowledge. That is our goal. So from compulsory to higher education, uh, because that, you know, Many reforms are now planned and then will be implemented from the next year. And then particularly, information competency is one of the important uh, key competence. And then to achieve such goal, uh, all school teachers are now, I mean, to teach information as a subject. Oh, very wonderful idea, since we are living in a new you know, kind of technology advanced society. And then we need information content. I mean, how to use your, not just smartphone, but how you can use that, you know, all big data. Uh, I mean, that time we live with big data and AI. So that we need some specific s skills which are not exist here, but uh, now, but uh, in the future we need to develop such kind of new skills. All good. <laughs> so, uh, information became a subject. Well, not just a subject, <coughs> but also it's a part of a math and science learning in uh, uh, elementary and middle school and high school. So that teacher is expected to, to teach information technology to some extent. And then particularly, <coughs> uh, from elementary schools on, uh, they call it programming skills to teach. So that all students in Japan will learn programming to some extent in, from elementary to high school or maybe university. So that's another necessitated kind of new skills for the 21st century. All good. All right, let's start. Uh, to compare Denmark and Japan, okay? This is the income distribution of data uh, called Gini coefficient. And then if the number is lower, I mean closer to zero, the society is more equal, okay? I think Denmark is around here. Here, Denmark. Where is Japan? Maybe somewhere here. Not here. So that already in 2017, maybe this data is wrong, um, Japan is more unequal than in Denmark. 
So that means that, of course, that the Denmark is one of the Scandinavian welfare states, so that, I mean, that all people's, I mean, economic resources, cultural resources, or many, many resources are probably more equally uh, distributed in, in Japanese society. And then Japanese society is moving towards, like this country, and more unequal. So that is, our situation is probably a bit different from what happened in uh, uh, Scandinavian countries or welfare states. So that's, I think, uh, because double edges, I mean, the results of any kind of uh, advancement in technology uh, resulted in differently, according to different shapes of society. So problem, what problems arose, I mean, to our lives, I mean, from such kind of the uh, glorious or, uh, you know, uh, rosy future in Japan? First issue is, who can teach this kind of subject efficiently? And then I will show you later that soon that, you know, the, what happens in the Japanese teaching professions currently. But the most serious problems now argued in Japanese government makes some of them what's the problem among Japanese teachers? Hmm. Aging. No. Work too, too long. Too long yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a problem. And then, but Still, the government, I think, a policy is always, I criticize that last 20, 30 years, you know, always that anything good, anything important, I mean, should be added to the new policy, but no scrap and build. What happens if you add and add and add anything good? What happens? Of course, all those kind of, you know, additional <coughs> tasks make teacher, teachers busier. <coughs> It's a very natural result, not sociological at all. It's a very simple mathematics question. And working condition of teachers, I mean, that's too overloaded. And then also, those kind of conditions of teachers, what would happen if we implement such kind of uh, too ambitious uh, reforms and implemented under such under resourced condition. Who suffer the most? That is my main question. Well, this is a recent report from the OECD, uh, 2018's Teaching Learning International Survey. And then it's reported Japanese teachers are the most busiest, busiest teachers in the world, I mean advanced society. So that this is the weekly, uh, I mean, how long they work a week, so that uh, 55 hours a day. And then among them, teaching is just this portion. Uh, this is OECD average, and then teaching time is less than the average, but total working hours are much longer. What they are doing? Extracurricular activities? other general, uh, general administrative work, and then preparation of lessons, I mean, all those kind of things are, you know, all make teachers busier. Busier than teachers in other countries. And this is a quotation from the same newspaper, but, you know, not uh, uh, showing uh, graphs, but uh, the last one showed school teachers in middle schools. But this one, this statement is about elementary school teachers. I mean, almost similar, I mean, kind of the length of the time they work in a week, uh, 54 hours a week. How many hours a day if you divide it by five days? Ten, more than 10 hours a day. How many here I think are people are working every day more than 10 hours? <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, good. But not so many. And then if you are 
from school teachers, then what would happen if you well, current condition is such a you know uh, heavy duty, heavy loaded work condition. Then you now teach programming. And if you are elementary school teachers, no, even you, you have no certificate to teach English. Uh, you have to teach English too from next year on. And then moral education becomes a subject, right? So that all teachers have to evaluate, assess how morally your students are you know, good or bad at each time, each term. So that all things are happening from the next year on to attain, to achieve society good and general. Wonderful idea, isn't it? <laughs> so all those kind of new burdens I think that may be necessitated and then probably uh, solved by new technology. I mean, to help teachers to save their time to do something. But if teachers couldn't manage well their own time, or schools cannot make good management, I mean, to allocate any kind of additional jobs, I mean, additional works, what would happen? Who, who are the most you know, suffering from that kind of under-resourced conditions? That's my question. And then, of course, I'm a sociologist, so it's a very number crunchy kind of presentation. Well, it's a bit old data, but uh, 2006, in University of Tokyo, uh, social scientists did a survey from uh, uh, aged from 20 to 40 years old. And then here it's a very simply asking people how often you access to internet. Of course, it was 2006. I think uh, more think uh, time uh, or days spent by people, I think, uh, today because smartphone enables people to access to internet much easier. But I think it shows some trends that how you can access to internet outside of uh, your work. And here you find that you know females are less, and uh, if you are educated more, uh, you are more likely to access to internet in 2006. And then if your occupation is professional, then you are more likely out of work, okay, out of your job. So that oh, it's something like that you can do for your major uh, or whatever that you are explore anything you can do with internet, and then. Importantly, I think uh, here, uh, household wealth, how rich you are, uh, your family at your age of 15. So that when you are young, how rich your household was. That is kind of the question that uh, not just current you know, wealth you own, but uh, what happens in your past. Then, it's a kind of the you know influence that you know if you are from a richer household at age 15, more likely. And then also this is the grade at the junior high school that is middle school at age 15 too. So if you are academically strong in your middle school age, you're more likely to access to internet when you are adult. So that's kind of the you know historical. <coughs> Uh, personal history, I think, uh, influenced later on your access to internet. Of course, it uh, was just 2006. But if you are given a um, smartphone to access freely, I mean, to any places, <coughs> what kind of site do you mostly look at? For your learning? Or entertainment? What? If we have just entertainment or learning, how people are divided by into two spheres, I mean, watching uh, and internet. Some good students maybe continue learning by internet, but other students who are not interested in learning in a traditional sense may not as learn as much as the first type of student. So that, this is a kind of an example of double edge. Oh, then I looked at the same things like the regression, and then it's a 
I divide it into two, two groups of by H, and then all the H, these are yellow lines are all you know important factors. But look at younger H. We suppose if you are younger, you are more likely to access internet. That is our knowledge of the generational changes, right? I mean that you are older people may not, I think, access as much as or as many times as younger people. But if you look at the younger people, of course, that, you know, they access more than older uh, ones, but the influence of uh, family wealth, household wealth, and then also mother's education degree matters. So that the younger more unequal in accessing internet. That is something long happens, I think, uh, in the Japanese society. And then finally, I looked at the problem solving skills. I think uh, uh, how much those kind of skills are distributed and equal. All these are just an explanation how I can make a measurement. Then uh, this is the result. I mean, again, that the 20 to 40 years old. And then if you have kind of problem solving skills that is another 21st first, first century competence, again, uh, your household wealth, that is important. So if you are from richer family, you're more likely to subject the answer that I have problem solving skills. Those kind of things may be related to some way, I mean, in the arguments of the double wage, uh, double uh, uh, which things, I mean, uh, things that uh, in uh, advanced, uh, advancement in the technology in the future. Okay. Oh. And then this is the last slide. I did uh, just a bit the different uh, survey data, but uh, this is the how much students committed to uh, new types of learning style, more individualized learning style. Okay. It's another idealistic I mean, changes in pedagogy. And then, but my results show that if you are from culturally richer family, you're more likely positively to commit to such kind of learning. I mean, that it's a you know, kind of uh, a new pedagogy. So that, again, that you know, idealistic pedagogy is probably realized to some extent. But who are most, you know, suffered or who are most the advantage is not a simple thing. It's not just a matter of education, but it matters of society. So that's the point I try to play the question. So, I mean, if we add anything good without disregarding, uh, you know, what resources we need, what happens? Well, you know, under resource conditions are exaggerated, and then if it's not Saluted by adding new resources, always that kind of a policy should fail. Or maybe will succeed only for a part of people, not who all people. That is the problem. But I would argue maybe later with one of the uh, person from the Ministry of Education in this room, <laughs> why? You guys have this kind of a mentality long time. <laughs> Although we notice that all problems happen. But always. I mean, recently, uh, university admission policies changed. You know, some of you? English uh, skills testing has just been announced that taking place in the two years. But it's just, you know, the government announced that we will postpone it for another four years because of the shortage of the preparation. Repeatedly, such kind of you know, things happen. So, at the end, my conclusion is fair, fairness is important part of the realization of society goal and there. But how society goal and there can achieve fairness in such kind of a poorly resourced uh, education reform? That is my story. Thank you very much.